Hi, welcome back to Orange Therapy on YouTube. My name is Julie. I am a professional counselor in South Carolina, and this guy is my co-counselor, Ed. Today, I'm going to be continuing on with the exploration from Brene Brown's book, Atlas of the Heart. Today, we're gonna to be exploring the emotions that we experience, the places we go when things aren't quite as they seem. <laughs> Sit back and let's learn about those things together. So one of the first emotions that Brene Brown explores in this particular chapter, when things aren't quite as they seem, is amusement. And I stayed here sitting on the floor with Ed because his hair is amusing. <laughs> amusement is the pleasurable, surprising emotion that we experience when we see something that brings us joy and is humorous and unexpected. And I'll tell you, I have um, been so amused by memes, and I will share them with my husband. I think probably he would say ad nauseum, uh, but I, I love me a good meme. If you've got a good meme, please email it to me or share it in the comments if we can do that here. Um, but I wanna share a story about the expression of amusement being exhibited by people who pulled up beside me in a car. I happen to drive a Jeep and Ed rides with me, of course, to work. He doesn't drive on his own. And he was in the back seat of the Jeep and, come here, buddy. And he was poking his head out of the Jeep and we pulled up to a stoplight and we were sitting at the stoplight beside a group of motorcycle riders. Now, it was a, a gang really <laughs> on motorcycles. They were mean mugging on their hogs and wearing their, their vests and they just looked so tough sitting on their motorcycles. Well, Ed had his head out the window and he was looking at them and they had these mean looks on their faces. And one of the gentlemen looked over and saw Ed with his purple mohawk, with his happy face looking out the window and he started laughing. He was clearly amused. He was surprised by a dog with a purple mohawk. And not only was he amused, he shared that with his friends. He got their attention. They were all pointing and laughing at the dog in the car with the purple mohawk. And that's amusement. Amusement is an important, um, refreshing type of emotion, one that's important to experience in the workplace. It's one that's in, important to experience in friendships, amusement, that surprising thing that brings us joy and happiness. All right, back up on my seat now. Um, the next emotion that we're going to explore is the emotion of bittersweet. And it's another mixed emotion um, a place that we go when things aren't quite as they seem and it's a mixture of happiness and sadness now it's not the same as ambivalence that we have explored before in bittersweet I know that I am happy and I'm sad at the same time it's a complex vacillation between happiness and sadness and again not the same as ambivalence I know that I'm feeling this way um, it's a complex emotion. It can begin to be evident at seven or eight years old, but it's not fully understood and, and expressed until somebody is 10 or 11 years old, typically. Bittersweet um, emotions happen when, okay, when, when my son was married, I was so happy that he was being married to the love of his life. But I also was sad that I was no longer the number one girl in his life. Now that's the way it should be, right? Our children are supposed to grow up and get married and, and it's appropriate that a man should leave his mother and father and go and, and be in relationship with somebody else. That's entirely appropriate. And I was so happy for him, but kind of sad for me, right? Another way that bittersweet is experienced is Facebook memories. If we lose somebody, then a memory pops up of that person. My mentor passed away two years ago yesterday uh, at the filming of this particular episode, and the memory was bittersweet, you know, bringing back up all of the thoughts and wonderfulness of, of her and how she poured into my life and, and frankly made what I'm doing now a, a possibility. But I miss her 
So there's a, a happiness on remembering how wonderful she was, but a sadness that I am missing her today. That's bittersweet, that happiness and sadness together. Uh, a very similar emotion that has us kind of looking to the past is nostalgia. And nostalgia is a context-specific bittersweet emotion plus a sense of yearning or loss of something. It's, it's a yearning for the way things used to be. Um, it usually comes out of feeling sadness right now. It's unlike bittersweet that is there's something that's happy but I'm experiencing sadness as it's brought to mind. Um, nostalgia is more I'm feeling sad and lonely and isolated now and I have a longing for the way things used to be when they were good. <clears throat> it, it tends to be idealized, self-protective, um, this self-protective version of the past that we think of, you know, and it can be damaging culturally. If people say, oh gosh, I wish that things were the way they used to be in the good old days. And the person who doesn't remember the days in the past in a positive light, they have a different view of the past might hear, what do you mean when people were knew their place? So we have to understand that nostalgia isn't always good. It's a double-edged sword, that culturally um, difficult piece. And it, it, it exists and that it can actually also um, complicate our own experience of the present and rumination on the past in this nostalgic way, wishing for something that isn't anymore. Um, spinning in that thought of the past can lead to is a contributor of depression. So it's something to just monitor yourself for, right? We can think about the past, we can miss things about the past, but we do need to have a more nuanced view that there was good, there also was not so good. That because I'm feeling sad now doesn't mean that everything was good then. I need to be able to understand I'm experiencing some nostalgia right now and I need to look at things with a nuanced view. When I understand what I'm doing, when I understand my emotions, I can then name it and I can go, is this entirely productive in this particular circumstance? Because nostalgia isn't always bad, but it can be. So we need to be aware of that. Cognitive dissonance is another state of, of um, tension between two ideas. It's more of a, a thought-based process rather than an emotion itself but it can lead to emotions so it's a state of tension between ideas attitudes beliefs and opinions two things that are psychologically inconsistent with one another say um, an idea or an example of cognitive dissonance would be I I know that smoking is dumb and it could kill me but I smoke two packs of cigarettes a day now I don't happen to smoke cigarettes that that doesn't that's not my poison for me, it would a cognitive dissonance would be, I know that potato chips are void of real benefits to my health and are high in calories and they don't help me lose weight and yet I eat a bag of potato chips when I'm watching my show in the evening, right? That's cognitive dissonance. And it can lead to regret and shame and sadness and frustration and anger with self. So cognitive dissonance, those that state of um, tension between two ideas. Be aware when you're engaging in that, right? You're not alone if you do. People do it all the time. So we need to be aware of what's going on. The paradox is another thought wrestling piece. Um, it can, but instead of it, having two opposing ideas that are held separately. It challenges us to stabilize and straddle the tension of the two conflicting ideas. Um, paradox says vulnerability is one of the first things I look for in others and the last thing I want to show in myself is courage in you and inadequacy in me. Um, it's the hard and the good together being in the same when we have paradox of those two thought wrestling ideas and we we do wrestle with them with the power of and we can grow so we've got these two ideas and we look at them and then we find the links between them these two things are existing together i'm going to wrestle with them i'm creative and and people often think creativity and, and discipline exist separately 
but that's not the case. If we have creativity and discipline, we can move things ahead. Um, freedom and responsibility. Sometimes people think of those things as separate, but we need to understand the links between these things that are separate. It's freedom and responsibility, not freedom or responsibility. These things exist together. Um, the last two emotions that Brene Brown explores in her chapter, um, this particular chapter of Atlas of the Heart, are irony and sarcasm. Irony is like in my past episode where I was very sick and I did a very brief episode on self-care. The irony wasn't lost, right? It's um, the literal meaning is different than intended. It's a little bit surprising. Sarcasm is usually used to ridicule, to tease, to criticize. The Greek meaning of sarcasm is literally to, to tear flesh. Now, both irony and sarcasm can be playful if they are used appropriately, but they can be used to hurt people if they are not. We need to be aware and not weaponize these particular emotions, these particular expressions. In order for sarcasm to be appropriate, um, we need to know the person really well. It needs to be playful. It needs to not be weaponized. But sarcasm isn't usually used that way. Sarcasm is usually used to express things um, that I really need to express, but I'm afraid to. I'm afraid to express them honestly and clearly because that requires vulnerability and I'm afraid. And so I'm going to express something with sarcasm or using some passive aggressive comments and that hurts the other person. Or I'm using it to criticize or to tease. And again, I guess it's why I don't like sarcasm very much because it's mean. Um, but it can be playful in certain situations and there are certain people that I feel quite comfortable being a little playful and sarcastic with because I trust them, because I know that they intend those things just to be teasing and playful, not to negatively or in a sideways fashion, in a passive fashion, communicate hurtful things. Um, something else to remember, sarcasm isn't usually appropriate to be communicated via text. People don't understand, doesn't translate well through text. We need to be able to see the person, hear how it's being expressed in order to fully understand sarcasm. Another thing to really be aware of is that children don't understand sarcasm very well until they get older, they don't get it. And that sarcasm can become the negative voice that they're feeling in themselves. So where a parent might mean something is playfulness, the child doesn't understand sarcasm, doesn't understand these things not meaning what, what are intended, and they take the literal meaning and they're very deeply hurt by it. So be careful with the use of sarcasm with children and with friends and with family members. Do I need to communicate something clearly and I'm afraid to? I don't need to use sarcasm for that. Do I want to criticize somebody or hurt them or ridicule them? Just don't do that. It's not kind. Um, sarcasm, save it for playfulness. Irony, notice that in situations. Enjoy the paradox. Work with your cognitive dissonance to figure things out. Remember that nostalgia is appropriate sometimes, but don't get stuck there. Engage in amusement. Accept the bittersweet. Enjoy being a human being, even with these difficult emotions. I hope that you enjoy me. <laughs> I hope that you join me here next time at Orange Therapy on YouTube. I also hope you enjoy it. Um, but I hope that you join me back here at Orange Therapy on YouTube, where you are welcome exactly as you are.